Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we open the word of God this morning, and we open the word of his prophet, should we not seek his guidance and ask that our minds be enlightened regarding the lessons that have gone in the past that have application for us today? Shall we seek his wisdom and be willing to be led by him so that that which we learn, we may be able to take to heart so that we may be better prepared to give the message that we are to give at this time in our history? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, We thank you for this opportunity that we have to join together, to study, to examine, to learn. We ask, Father, for your blessing. For we're going to need your wisdom. We are going to need to be led by your spirit. And we will need your angels around us so that we may carefully consider all that we are seeing and apply this properly as lessons for us for today. Direct us now, help us so that as we learn, we may keep our eyes fixed on you so that the lessons become part of our character, that we are shown what to avoid so that we may then more properly give the warning message that you would have given to this world. For this opportunity, Father, we thank you. For this time learning of you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now as we were going through things yesterday, we were addressing the fact that Balak offered to Balaam great reward for Balaam to come and curse Israel. Now, as Mrs. White has written, Balak could not even now relinquish his hope of securing the destruction of Israel. He decided that the imposing spectacle presented by the vast encampment of the Hebrews, arranged in perfect order, each tribe around its own standard, and the tabernacle of God among them, had so intimidated Balaam that he dared not practice his divinations against them. As we were, as we were addressing yesterday, this means not only were they observing the encampment and the placement of the tabernacle in the center, but that they could see the pillar of cloud during the day that had then been leading the children of Israel. The king hoped that a change of place might affect something in his favor. He would then take the prophet to some point where only a small part of the host of Israel might be seen. And if he could there get Balaam to curse them in detached parties, the whole camp might soon be devoted to destruction. <clears throat> How is this different <clears throat> in thought or practice from what the Amalekites had attempted to do? Or is it different from that? The Amalekites, when 
the children of Israel came out of Egypt, attacked from the rear. They attacked the aged, the infirm, those were th that were at the very back of the, the group. So here is Balak. He wants Balaam to see just a small portion of the children of Israel because he thinks that the spectacle that he is observing is too imposing for him. In all of this, Balak seems to have had perfect confidence in that Balaam's enchantments could paralyze the strength of Israel and bring confusion and defeat upon their armies. What lesson is being offered here? Well, it reminds me of where Ellen White said that in the end time, our foes would be you know, reviling us and belittling us because we are so few in number and we seem defenseless. And I know Satan loves to practice this divide and conquer tactic constantly. And he figures he could get us into factions and fighting among ourselves. Then we're easy prey. We need to be very alert to his wiles and just cling to God because with God, we are a majority. And God is not limited to save by many or by few, as Jonathan the armor bearer said, or Jonathan said to his armor bearer. What lesson can we learn from the example of the two sticks? When you have two sticks that are bound together, is it harder to break two sticks than it is to break one? Yes, much, much harder. So yeah, we need to be restored. We need to be united in strength in God. In this, in this type of situation, even the smallest, even the weakest, can become strong in Christ, we need the type of unity where the strong and the weak together are forming through God a defense against the wiles of our adversary. God knows well that we are going to be attacked. If we have taken the time to learn the lessons and to have committed these to heart, even when we are attacked, we will be given the words to speak, we will be given the examples to our minds so that we might have more perfect faith that God is indeed leading us. So then even those that look to be weak among us may become strong in the word. Balaam was now conducted to the top of an elevation called Pisgah, where another trial was to be made. He had not given up all hope of the reward, and he was willing to do all in his power to carry out the purposes of a king. On this height were erected, as, as before, seven altars, whereon were placed the same offerings as the first. The king and his princes were again left by the sacrifices while Balaam retired to meet with God. Again, the prophet was entrusted with a divine message, which he was powerless to alter or withhold. Balaam, again, was given this message. 
Balaam's heart wanted one thing, but our heavenly father overruled the desires of his heart. When he appeared to the anxious, expectant company, the eager question was put to him, what hath the Lord spoken? The answer, as before, struck terror into the heart of king and the princes. And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. So, is this the second parable? Is this the second of seven that is seen here? For as we talked yesterday, there were seven different parables that Balaam uttered in front of Balak and his princes. Right. So when you get to, um, let me see here. I'm just not looking at it right now. Um, yeah. So his second, this is his second oracle. Right. So this second is parable, the, according to this. Yeah, so it's going to be the second of seven. Okay. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Now here. As this would have been considered by the translators. 1 Samuel 15, 29. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent. For he is not a man that he should repent. Malachi 3, 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Romans 11.29, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Finally, Titus 1.2. In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. We have multiple witnesses here. One from a disobedient prophet. Several from those, whether we're dealing with Samuel, Malachi, Romans, James, or Paul, that note that God cannot lie. God is the father of truth, while our adversary is the father of lies. Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment in Jacob or against Jacob. Neither is there any divination against Israel according to this time. It shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, what hath God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. In this prophecy, 
So in one place, she calls it a parable. In scripture, excuse me, it is called a parable. Here, she calls it a prophecy. Balaam sets forth the unchangeable character of God. Men are fickle, unreliable, especially is this the case, where their minds are not under the direction of the Holy Spirit. That is a very blunt statement. When men are controlled by the prince of darkness, no dependence can be placed upon their promises or engagements. But God, being infinite in wisdom and goodness, his purposes and decrees are immutable. They are without change. It is stated in the scriptures that God repented that he had done so much for man when only in gratitude and disobedience were the return for all of his mercies. Here the Lord speaks after the manner of men that finite men may understand him. When God has pronounced judgments against a people as he did against Nineveh, and like Nineveh, they believe the word of God, humble themselves before him and turn from their evil ways, he revokes his sentence and gives the transgressors of his law another trial. But in all the history of God's dealings, it will be found that although he may bear long with the sinner, disobedience will surely meet its punishment. There are limits to the forbearance of God. There is a point at which it becomes necessary to interpose his vengeance and visibly to rebuke the impiety of men. It is no less apparent that those who love and obey God's law will realize that he means what he says, and that all his precious promises to the faithful and obedient will be fulfilled to the letter. What does this paragraph say to you? How does this relate with all that we've been addressing regarding Balaam, regarding the messages of Revelation 14, and righteousness by faith? Can we trust God that when he says he will do something, it will be done? The Lord solemnly announced that it was his purpose to bless Israel and that he would not sanction oppression or outrage against the posterity of Jacob. While they should comply with the conditions which he had given them, he would be faithful in the fulfillment of all of his promises. Balaam was made to understand the confidence and the strength of Israel. The shout of a king is among them. Christ enshrined in the cloudy pillar, was in their midst, reigning over and protecting them, and leading them forth to battle and to victory. Their recent conquests, while moving forward in the strength of God, had inspired them with hope and with courage. At the word of God, they were ready to advance or retreat, to put on the armor or to lay it off with the same confident assurance of final victory. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. The rhinoceros is one of the most powerful of animals, and Balaam uses this creature as a figure to show how vain it is for any earthly power to array itself against the Most High. God hath accomplished his will in bringing Israel from bondage and idolatry in Egypt, notwithstanding the oppression of Pharaoh and his hosts. It would be safer for lesser animals to attack the powerful unicorn than for finite man to seek to turn aside the purposes of the infinite one.
Awed by these revelations of divine power, Balaam exclaimed, Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. The great magician had tried his power of enchantment in accordance with the desire of the Moabites. But concerning this very occasion, it should be said of Israel, What hath God wrought? The fact would be recorded upon the pages of history that while Israel was under the divine protection, no people or nation, though aided by the power of Satan, should be able to prevail against them. All the world would, should wonder at the marvelous work of God in the behalf of his people, that a man determined to pursue a sinful course should be so controlled by divine power as to utter, instead of, instead of empirications, the richest and the most precious promises in the language of sublime and impassioned poetry. How does this relate to us with the history that we have observed from 1856 to the present day? So 1856 being chosen because of 1856 being the point where <clears throat> where Hiram Edson <laughs> had begun writing those articles regarding the seven times. Yeah, so you have the seven times articles published in 1856. And we also have seven times until the church itself is founded officially. Right. Yeah, so from the right publishing of his articles to the foundation of the Adventist church. Um, okay. So, so you're saying against the foundation, this, that nothing can stand against it, even though it's been rejected, God's promises still will stand. The point is, yeah. That while Israel was under the divine protection. Now, one of the one of the things that I've come to, under, to understand is that when the church is pure, all of the gifts would be active. All of the gifts of the spirit. So, since Mrs. White passed in 1915, can it be said that the church has been pure? No. It's got a decline. When we choose to set aside portions of her admonitions, because they attack some closely held idol. We have a problem. Believe the prophets and you shall prosper. Exactly. While Israel was under the divine protection, no people or nation though aided by all the power of Satan, should be able to prevail against them. The movement is today being called to trust in the word of God To the point that even when it looks like it is total foolishness to the world, that we still believe that God is leading 
and God is in control. This, again, for me, reinforces the validity of July 18th. All the world should wonder at the marvelous work of God in behalf of his people. The world right now <clears throat> believes those of us that gave the message of July 18th are nothing but deluded fanatics. Are we willing to stand to accept that God is in control even when other brothers and sisters are saying to us that this is not of God? The favor of God at this time manifested toward Israel was to be an assurance of his protective care for his obedient, faithful, children at that time. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to read it the way it's actually written. The favor of God at this time manifested toward Israel was to be an assurance of his protective care for his obedient, faithful children in all ages. Mm -hmm. This is a promise that he is keeping and has kept throughout this era of sin upon this planet. When Satan should inspire evil men to annoy to misrepresent, to harass, and destroy God's people, this very occurrence would be brought to their remembrance and would strengthen their courage and faith in God. The future success of Israel and the doom of their enemies is further set forth in the words, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. The future success of this movement is further set forth in those words. Surely this message should have been a sufficient warning to both Balaam and the king of Moab to make no further attempt to injure the people so signally protected by divine power. Yet what do we see here? We see Balaam seeking the wages of unrighteousness. We see Balak wanting to curse that which God has blessed. <clears throat> And Balak said unto Balaam, neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. But Balaam answered and said unto Balak, told not I thee, saying, all that the Lord speaketh that I must do. Now, while Balaam is being truthful here, this is not what he wants to do. Right? And Balak said unto Balaam, Come, I pray thee, I will bring thee unto another place. Peradventure it will please God that thou mayest curse me them from thence. And Balak brought Balaam unto the top of Peor that looketh toward Jeshema. And Balaam said unto Balak, build me here seven altars and prepare me here seven bullocks and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had said and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. 
So now they are on the Mount Peor. The king of Moab was disheartened and distressed at the second failure of his efforts to secure a curse upon Israel. In the anguish, anguish of his soul, he exclaimed, neither curse them at all nor bless them at all. Yet a faint hope still lingered in his heart, and he determined to make another trial. He now conducted Balaam to Mount Peor, where was the temple noted most of all for the disgusting scenes of licentiousness there enacted in honor of their God. Here the same number of altars were erected as before, and the same number of sacrifices were offered, but Balaam went not alone as at other times to learn God's will. He made no pretense of sorcery, but standing by the altars, he looked around upon the widely spread tents of Israel. Again, the Spirit of God rested upon him, and the divine message came from their, his lips in the same poetic language as before. So this is to be the third parable. Is this not the third parable uttered by Balaam? Yep, it's the third one. Now, a comment from the chat for consideration. Balak called for neutrality in a spiritual war. Can we have neutrality? in this type of a war? Can we sit on the fence? Can we take the attitude of time will tell? No, can't sit on the fence, can't do the time will tell thing. Uh, we have to be active and continually working with, uh, in a forward motion. Now, since they are, since Mrs. White is addressing here that Balaam is conducted to Mount Peor, where was the temple noted most of all for the disgusting scenes of licentiousness that was enacted in honor of their God? Does this bring up any other example presented within scripture? of a time where Israel is presented with a test. Certainly at Mount Carmel. With Elijah? Yes, that's, that's what I'm, I'm referring to. And then there's a test with the golden calf too. Now in the situation with Elijah, they faced two other groups, right? Who was it? Yes, they did. Who was it that they came face to face with at Carmel? Uh, priest of the grove and uh, once the priest of Baal, of Baal. What I would say to you today, that this temple on Mount Peor, we could easily apply as being the equivalent of those of the priests of the grove. That at the beginning, when Balaam is being shown the encampments of Israel, that they were on a mount wherein had been a temple 
for bail. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. As the valleys are they spread forth as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of line aloes, which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters, he shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. And his king shall be higher than Agag. And his kingdom shall be exalted. He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion. Who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesses thee, and cursed is he that curses thee. Blessed, he will be blessed. Those that seek to curse him shall be cursed. The prosperity of God's chosen people is here represented by some of the most beautiful figures to be found in nature. The prophet likens Israel to fertile valleys covered with abundant harvests, to flourishing gardens watered by never failing springs, to the fragrant sandal tree and to the stately cedar. The figure last mentioned is one of the most strikingly beautiful and appropriate to be found in the inspired word. The cedar of Lebanon has the most honorable position among the trees in the Bible. It was regarded with reverence by all the people of the Holy Land. The class of trees to which it belongs is found wherever man has gone. In all the earth, it flourishes in the heat, yet defies the cold. It grows luxuriantly beside the rivers and fountains of waters, and yet thrives upon the sandy waste. It plants its roots deep among the rocks of the mountain and boldly stands in defiance of the tempest. Its leaves are bright and green when all else has perished at the breath of winter. The wind playing upon its foliage calls forth a strain of soft, sad music and a flood of perfume that fills the air with its spicy fragrance. The divine hand has exalted the cedar as king over the forest. It is called the tree of the Lord and is named among the most precious and beautiful of God's works in the earth. So great was its value that even in ancient times, only kings and princes could dwell in houses of cedar. Just a comment here. So you you had mentioned a Hiram Metzen's articles in 1856. Okay. Now uh, the first article is published January 3rd, and the last article is published February 28th, which is a, uh, a period of uh, from first publication to the last 56 days, so eight weeks. Um, but there's two weeks in which the article is not published: January 31st and February 7th. So there's seven articles, right? Okay. So were you equating the seven articles with the seven uh, oracles or parables? I hadn't looked at it that way. Okay. I was looking at this as we have these seven oracles with these seven parables. And can we line this up with specific events that we have seen either within the church or within the movement. Okay. Well, I think there might be a connection, the seven articles and the seven parables. Okay. I mean, there's a connection, at least the number seven. Oh, there's definitely that. <laughs> um. So I'm thinking about this a bit more. Sorry for the interruption. No, there's not an interruption. Someone like Ezekiel. Didn't, wasn't it Ezekiel that had 13 um, prophecies in his? Yeah, thir 13, 13 gates. Yeah, 13 gates in Ezekiel. Yeah. Now that had something 
Mm-hmm. I kept seeing the number as being that, you know, 13. That's the rebellion. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what he was. He was uh, 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 discussing the rebellion that uh, Israel was doing. So these other things, these seven, they should have some sort of significance. I know he doesn't do, do things without without some sort of a plan. <laughs> we just need to figure that out. Yeah, and we know that, um, like in Ezekiel, of course, some of the dates, four of the dates line up with dates in 1844. And two of those dates are the same dates in the Julian calendar in Ezekiel's time as uh, dates on the uh, Gregorian calendar in 1844, specifically July 21st and um, um, October 22nd. So, so there's symbolism in the number of days and their relation, but also the dates themselves. Okay. Now, as we continue to proceed, okay. Numbers 24. Oh, and just one other thing, too, just a reminder what is it, Phil? Is um, from uh, the date when he begins to prophesy to the siege, which the event that is that he's predicting is. 1629 days that date that Odil that number that Odilio gave us okay that has all these relationships to our other prophetic numbers so it's kind of interesting the six 1629 days anyway sorry okay. why be sorry all of we, we have to consider all of these things yeah, it just it just interrupts the thought sometimes, but um, process. Yes, I don't I don't know how else to do it. I mean, I could put it in the chat, and then you could pick up on it and uh, comment on it when you're when it's when you're ready. The whole point of this of these studies is for us to be able to have discussions. Yeah, and we are going to numbers twenty four now. Right. So what relationship do you see that in that, Theodore? What makes it like we're finishing we're finishing one chapter, we're going to another. So I wasn't really interrupting at a major spot. Okay. okay. Now <clears throat> as they would show in the 1769 Bible, we begin where Balaam leaving divinations prophesieth the happiness of Israel. By verse 10, Balak in anger dismisses him. And then Balaam prophesieth the star of Jacob and the destruction of some nations. So we're going to go into the third parable, but then we're going to get into the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not at other, as at other times to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. Why would he turn and set his face to the wilderness instead of going off alone to meet with God? Why would he stand by these altars and stand with Balak? What, what symbolism can we, can we take from this? I'm, I'm looking at this, that Balaam is now casting his lot more firmly with Balak. 
even though he knows that he's not going to be able to speak anything against the children of Israel, that he's dropping all sense of pretense. Yes, but at the same time, he realized that his enchants- enchantments are useless. God is on Israel's side. Thank you. And Balaam lifted up his eyes. And he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes. And the spirit of God came upon him. Now, when we're looking at this. We're given several examples. In Numbers 11.25, And the Lord came down in, in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. <clears throat> and then we have an example from chapter 10 of 1 Samuel, but we have a doubling. So we have 10, 10. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. Who was this that is being referred to here where they came to a hill and is met by the company of prophets? Saul, right? be Saul, Saul would. Exactly. First Samuel nineteen twenty, and Saul sent messengers to take David, and when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. Nineteen twenty three. And he went thither to Naoth in Ramah, and the Spirit of God was upon him also, and he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. In Second Chronicles fifteen one, and the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. We're given many examples where the spirit of God comes upon those. Some that are righteous and some that are not. And when the spirit of God comes upon you, there is nothing that you can do save what God would have you to say or to do. And he and Balaam took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said. But the alternate Hebrew would read. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, hath said, and the man who had his eyes shut, but now opened. A man who was blind, but is now able to see. A man that was spiritually blind, now has spiritual sight. He hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. If we were to look at this in Numbers 24.4, how is this word vision being translated? What kind of vision is this? How would we see this from the Hebrew?
So this this is um, a type of vision that comes from the root chaza to gaze at, from which we get chazon. It's a machaze. Um, is that what you're talking about in verse four? I'm asking that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so this isn't this isn't the usual that we see chazon or mara, but it is based upon a, a visual. Uh, Sighting. But it is the same word that we would we would see in Genesis 15 1. Right? Yeah. So dealing with um, Abraham. Yeah. So that's gonna be uh, where he has this uh, prophecy where God uh, confirms the covenant. Because as that reads, and after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. But we also find it in Ezekiel 13, 7, the second vision of Ezekiel, where it is said, have ye not seen a vain vision? And have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas you say, the Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Does the Lord give a lying vision? Well, no, God doesn't give a lying vision. So here, Balaam is being shown. He has heard the words of God. He has seen the vision of the Almighty. He now has his spiritual eyesight. And it is sharpened. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob. And thy tabernacles, O Israel, as the valleys are they spread forth, as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of line aloes, which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in, my, in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. All of this directly in this third parable are words that are going to upset and frustrate Balak. Now, when they're looking at this, as we addressed just a few minutes ago, this is being done at a near a temple on Mount Peor. Near a temple, as I would presume to present to you, that we would call similar to that of the priests of the grove. Now, as the fervent imagination of the prophet kindled at the view which God presented before him, he could picture the prosperity of Israel by nothing more beautiful than groves of cedars stirred by the wind of the morning, waving their green boughs in the valleys. 
The righteous in all ages are represented by the cedars of Lebanon. The highest honors belong to those who walk humbly with God. The lowliest disciple of Jesus is in God's sight of higher rank than of kings or princes. Balaam prophesied that Israel's king would be greater and more powerful than Agag. This was the name given to the kings of the Amalekites, who were at this time a very powerful nation. But if true to God, Israel would subdue all of her enemies. The king of Israel was the son of God, the majesty of heaven, and his throne was one day to be established on the earth and his power to be exalted above all earthly kingdoms. Balaam lifts his voice of warning to all men who should live upon the earth, from Balak to the last enemies of God, to desist from their purpose of destroying God's children. For the curse intended for Israel would recoil upon the guilty heads of those who framed it. When they seek to curse the children of God, the curse is rebounds upon them that's how i read that is there any other way that you could you could look at this what are your thoughts It goes along with what measure you need, it shall be needed unto you again, and you reap what you sow. Okay. <clears throat> and Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he smote his hands together, and Balak said unto Balaam, I called thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Balak is recognizing that Balaam has now pronounced blessing after blessing after blessing upon the children of Israel. These blessings had come from God alone. As long as the children of Israel chose to remain faithful to God. How can we apply this to our time? How do we apply this to the movement today? What kind of message does this give us? Balak in anger continued, therefore now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. And Balaam said unto Balak, spake I not also to thy messengers, which thou sentest unto me, saying, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own hand. But what the Lord saith, that will I speak. As he listened to the words of the prophet, a tempest of disappointed hope, of fear and of rage, swept over Balak's soul. And he broke forth in a flood of angry reproaches. He was indignant that Balaam could have given him the least encouragement of a favorable response. 
when everything was determined against him. <clears throat> he regarded with scorn the prophet's compromising, deceptive course. In terror and dismay, he smote his hands together, feeling that his people must indeed become a prey to Israel. He did not understand how deeply Balaam desired to gratify the hopes of the Moabites and that he had been compelled by the power of God to bless where he had hoped to curse. Enraged at the prophet's folly in letting slip the proffered wealth and honor, the king exclaimed fiercely, Therefore now flee back, flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee to great honor, but lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. The answer was that the king had been forewarned that Balaam could speak only the words that God should give him. Now there's a comment in the chat. Isaiah 54, 17 and 59, 19. Why? What application do you, do you see here? Well, I'll have to read it to you. 54.17 says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. And 59, 19 says, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall rise up a standard against him. Okay. Any other thoughts at this point? in relation to what we're reading here right now. It's uh, that the Protestant churches will speak up. I think that the Protestant churches are going to speak up and I think that it's very possible that we may see the Catholic communion speaking up as well. But in a, in a way of looking at this, is it also possible that we may see the Adventist church speaking up at this point? There are a few that do and that will. Okay. And now behold, I go unto my people, come therefore, and I will advertise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. Now, as we would look at this out of the current editions of the King James, they would call this Balaam's final oracle. This would be a title not in the 1769 or the 1611 editions. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said. So here again, Balaam is recognizing that he had been, his eyes had been spiritually shut now his eyes are spiritually opened. He hath said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. Are we not given examples? where Ellen White, in vision, had her eyes open, yet 
she was said not to be breathing. Yes. I've read a few accounts. Okay. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite through the princes of Moab, in the alternate reading, and destroy all the children of Sheth. So this is a pronouncement of destruction upon the children of Moab, upon the leadership, upon the princes, upon the entirety of Moab, right? Yes. As an alternate. We're referred to 2 Samuel 8, verse 2, and Jeremiah 43, 45. And he smote Moab and measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground, even with two lines measured he put to put to death, and with one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. Now we have Jeremiah 48, 45. They that fled stood under the shadow of Heshbon because of the force. But a fire shall come forth of Heshbon and a flame from the midst of Sihon and shall devour the corners of Moab and the crown of the head of the tumultuous ones. Now, would we say that this next pronouncement and Edom shall be a possession, Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies and Israel shall do valiantly. Would this be the next of the parables? Or is this just part of the final it, parable? It's just part of that um... So yeah, so you have the, every time when it says he took up his parable. Okay. So that's going to be verse 15 um, and verse, uh, verse 21. Okay. And, and, and then um, yeah, 21 and then where's the other one? So what, what you're saying is we need to watch for, and he took up his parable. Yeah, verse 20, 21, and 23. So 15, 20, 21, and 23, it says, he and he took up his parable. It has that phrase. Okay. So those would be the four parables in this last section, which they call the final oracle. Now, you know, so I'm puzzled at this a little bit because... I mean, I'm not sure why they say it's the final oracle. I mean, obviously, there isn't a lot of narrative here in these final oracles. He's just basically steady, stating four parables in a row um, without, without all the usual comments that we had in the first three parables. Um, but you, you have to see it as four. You know, altogether, there would be seven seven times that this word parable, that he takes up his parable. Okay. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. So here, first, we're talking about Edom, which, of course, is Esau. Seir is his mountain. Israel shall do valiantly. 
And then out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, speaking of Christ, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. Now, when they're using a phrase like that, of the city, in the Hebrew, what are they saying? So we're looking at this in the spiritual manner. Right. Uh, out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, which is Christ, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. That's going to be all those that um, well, which are going to be destroyed, right? Uh, you, would, you would infer that the um, second resurrection, possibly. Wouldn't this just be a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD? This is also true. So how do we apply that for now? We can see this as being regarding the, this re, with the uh, destruction of Jerusalem. There's several other points we could make, but how do we apply this for now, this time? Because if this is a prophecy, it is given for our admonition at this time. It could um, be the destruction of that great city, Babylon, that ruleth over the kings of the earth. This can't be Babylon, because this is referring to Jacob. But I'm talking about God destroying spiritual Babylon at the end of the world. Yeah, I'm just saying that this verse isn't talking about spiritual Babylon. This is talking first about Christ and then the city, which would be symbolically the city of Jerusalem. So the city of Jerusalem is becoming the symbol here. And so can we apply that to uh, the Sunday law? Well, yeah, the Sunday, the Sunday law is typified by the destruction of Jerusalem. Right, and so that's what I'm seeing anyway. Um, that would actually be the Adventist community if, in that respect uh, that didn't accept the call. Yeah, so, so this vision is the one that's commonly referred to when you think of uh, Balaam's prophecies. Right, the star that shall come out of Jacob, right, and the city that shall rise out of Israel, and um, I mean the reason that that's referenced is this is going to be uh, understood um, in in the New Testament, right? So this is going to be referenced. I'm trying to find the verses here. Um, Uh, specifically I can't find the actual verse that because I'm I'm pretty sure this is quoted in the New Testament um, anybody know the verse where it's quoted Sorry, what was it that you were looking for? Uh, that this this prophecy of Balaam is referenced in the New Testament. I just can't find it. It's in Jude, I think. Is it in Jude? I think so. If it's not in Jude, it would be in Peter. Yeah. Oh. Um. No, that's not it. Yeah, it's in Jude 11. 
Yes, there it is. You're right. Jude 11. Um, that's going to talk about the error of Balaam. But I'm just talking about the prophecy itself being referenced. I mean, we know that they see his star in the east. Um, I just can't find it. I'll have to record. And when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. So the alternate reading that Amalek was the first of the nations that warred against Israel. For we see in Exodus 17, verse 8, still the numbers of July 18th, just in a different order. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Moses is told. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. In 1 Samuel 15, the admonition is given. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Yet, and he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. So the alternate would tell us, and when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations that warred against Israel. But his latter end shall be even to destruction, that he perish forever. Okay, Matthew 2.2, 2, why? I just found that verse about the star in the east. We have seen a star in the east. Okay. So then. Yeah, this is referring to the idea that um, since they see this star, they're thinking of Balaam's prophecy. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought there was a place where it was referenced more clearly than this, but I can't find it. All right. Numbers 24, 21. And he looked on the Kenites and he took up his parable and said, strong is thy dwelling place and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. Nevertheless, the Kenite shall be wasted until Asher shall carry thee away captive. But yet the Hebrew also spells instead of the Kenite, they're also called Cain, K-A-I-N. What does it what does it mean the nest in a, a rock? Putting the nest that thy nest in a rock. Could it mean that they are abiding with in caves? I mean How should we look at this? If I look at what I have in front of me, 
thy nest. thy chamber or dwelling. And this is contracted from Hebrew 7077. And then the rock, Selah, to be lofty, a craggy rock, literally or figuratively a fortress a stronghold. This is also a pun. Okay. Because of the word nest and um, kenite are, are basically the same word. How else would you look at the pun? Well, that's just a pun. It's a play on words that they're that the Kenite is going to put his dwelling place in a nest. So they use a word that is the same as the word Kenite. It's just okay. the word Ken, right? Because yeah, because Kenite is um, what's the thing here? Ken, uh, Ken, Kenny, right? So. So they just, they just, they, and it's quite, quite common in Hebrew. Uh, if you read the Bible in Hebrew, you'll see these little plays on words. Okay. Well, I've seen rock. What I was thinking was, you know, the rock of Jesus Christ. But I, and, uh, yeah, but these are not. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's hard to say what this parable is about the Kenites, um, who who's being referred to, because they're going to be carried away by the Assyrians. Could it be for a time they put their their nest on the rock, which is Jesus Christ, and then it says on the next verse it says, nevertheless, the Kenite shall be wasted. To me, that, that would suggest it's a short time, but they put, I mean, they put the strong, the strong, strong in thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. Well, anyway, that's, a, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I, yeah I, I don't think that's what it's referring to, but I wouldn't discount it. It's just I, I don't read the sentence that way. Um, the Kenites are strong in their dwelling place. They put their nest in a rock. So even though they have their own sort of fortress, uh, they're going to be carried away captive by the Assyrians. So the, this rock okay. shouldn't okay. be Christ. This is some kind of uh, thing that they trust in. They trust in their fortifications. Okay. But they're still going to be carried away captive. Okay. I stand corrected. I apologize. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, there still might be an application there some way, but. Um, I mean, we've looked at the Kenites before. You can see in some of the uh, geography and um, archaeological uncoverings that, that that's exactly what they would do. Uh, some of the tribes would carve their fortifications right directly out of a, a huge chunk of stone, basically, mountain in a sense. At least that's some of the fortifications that I've seen in, in some of the archaeological finds. Sure. Okay. Now, we are coming close to the end of our time today. We're going to need to take this back up tomorrow and to complete what we're looking at here regarding the Kenites and the interrelationship 
with this, with this prophecy, with, with Abram. And we also need to note that Heber and Jael apparently had good relations with the Kenites. So we're going to refresh our memories with that as well. Are there any other comments or questions before we close today's meeting? Yes, I got uh, sort of a question. Or, okay. well, yeah, it is a question with along with a suggestion. So um, I spend a lot of time copying and pasting this stuff to get the exact same stuff that you've got already. Sure. And uh, what I'm wondering is, is I, I've asked this before, is possibly send out a copy of the original um, presentation before you, you know, finished it because we talked about this sort of before and, and you said that you didn't want to send these out until they were finished. And so all I'm saying is, is that for, e for ease of tracking, okay. um, it would be nice if you, uh, before we went into a chapter that you sent out those, those preliminary notes that you have, which has the verses and then it has the, marginal notes in it, other comments that you have decided to put in there prior to putting anything else in, you know, as our conclusions. Um, the reason I, I say that is because I've spent an inordinate amount of time trying to reproduce the exact same thing you've already got and you've already, you've already made it already. It would be such a, a time conservation thing for me. Okay. And, and I can be marking those things up and, um, and keep the notes that I make on these things. Because I, I do make these notes and I go back over these uh, presentations and go through the transcripts to, to also pull out any other things that, you know, that caught my attention or didn't catch my attention. And I want to go back and review what was said, those kinds of things. And I also add those things, those comments in with, these notes that I'm building off of your uh, basic construction, but I'm, I'm, I'm copying it, but not necessarily uh, doing it in the same manner. And, and it doesn't look near as nice as yours do. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, what, I'll, what I'll do is I'll see to it that this for numbers 24 and also numbers 25 gets sent out. Yeah, that would be very, very nice. I, I appreciate you doing it. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Any other comment? Any other question? Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have spent in study, in conversation, and in learning. Direct us now through this day. Help us that we may more understand that that you would have us to understand, that we may more properly represent your character with all with whom we come in contact. Thank you, Father, for this time. Help us that we may assemble again before you. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.